And now, from the studios of New Hope Hilo, Hawaii, when people connect. Yay! We are here to connect with people. And hopefully when you came in, you're already connecting with one another. I don't know if you all know this, but for Father's Day, all of you fathers get a steak breakfast this morning. Steak breakfast. Not now. So I think somebody just left. Uh, it's after service, but all the fathers get a free steak breakfast today, as well as dessert. Apple pie a la mode. And our a la mode is not like a la mode. It's a la mode, capital A, capital M, a la mode. So we, we just want to bless the fathers in an in a, in a easy way that fathers love food. All fathers love food. But we want to bless you in that way. Also this morning, uh, we have our all stars from our T-ball, our, our coach pitch and our, our Pinto division, our, uh, I think, Mustang, Mustang and Pinto division uh, here with us this morning. Some of them could make it this early. And Pastor Marshall was wearing the jersey but we really wanted to honor our baseball team all-star players because that is, a, that is a, uh, a, a prize right there. But our Pintos division under Coach Wally Adviento, Journey Lealoha made our all-stars. With our New Hope Angels all-stars, uh, Mustangs under Steve Martino, Salvatore Martino, Ian Ferruli, Toby Jackson, and Christian Kaiden. Nakamura made all-stars. And some of them are here this morning, I, I think, yeah. Salvatore is here. <laughs> Journey is here. So we wanted just to honor them this morning and thank them. Yes, congratulations. These are our all-stars. And so we just wanted to bless them this morning and, and pray over them just real briefly. If you could just reach your hand forward, we're going to pray over them. Lord, we pray your blessing over these two. That even though they may be called all-stars in baseball, you've already seen them as your all-stars. And so on this Father's Day, Lord, we pray your blessing over them. That they will remember this day. That we honor them because you honor them. You love them. You created them. And may they have a purpose that, you, that they recognize that comes from you in this world so that they can be effective for your purposes. We trust in you. We pray your protection over them and their families. Thank you for their families who have invested in them. We pray this in Jesus' name. And we all said amen. amen. Congratulations, gentlemen. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, we can head right down this side. So thank you for being here this morning. And, and because it's a sports kind of theme, uh, we, we are going to do a, a friendly competition. And so I, I think we have a, do we have a volunteer father, Matt? Do we have a, is it Steve? Coach Steve? Are you just volunteering right now? Yeah. So... <clears throat> Because we're talking about when people connect and, and when families connect, uh, we're just going to do a, a quick uh, competition. I'm not going to compete because it's not fair, right, if I, if I compete and it just goes in and you feel pressure. So I want to take away the pressure and not even shoot the basketball. You know, I don't like making anybody shame. So, uh, so we're going to have you compete against a former NFL player. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is not too hard. So... Uh, this morning, our guest speaker is a former NFL player, Ed Tandy McGlasson. And he was with our men this weekend at our men's conference, and what a blessing he is. But I'm going to welcome up Ed Tandy McGlasson, if he could come up. Yes. Yes. <laughs> he tried to break your arm just now, just so that. Oh, thank you. Oh, bless you, sweetheart. <laughs> She's like, I, I cannot reach that high. I cannot go that high. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Ed, here it is. It's, it's pretty simple, and What's you can it? stand there. That's a basketball. We figure <laughs> here's a center. So, okay. so Steve, are we gonna have a real shot? No, no practice. No, back over here. Oh, uh, up to you. Yeah, yeah, okay. No, <laughs> you, no. no. no you, you, you gotta come here. So, we made it a little bit flat, just in case it bounces off and hits somebody in the face. We're liable insurance purposes, okay. and you know. The, All right. Okay. Anyway. Okay. So here's the deal. You can win 100 grand. Wow. If you make this, wow. yeah, and, and, and so here's the deal, here's the purpose, because as fathers, we got one shot in this life to be the dads God created us to be. Yeah. So not to put pressure on you, I'll have Pastor Ed go first. You can't, you can't cover his eyes, you can't. You'd be blind. Yeah, so here we go. 
Oh. Good pass. Good pass. Good pass. It's, it's, it's kind of windy. It is windy wind. in here. Yeah. I, I felt the breeze come through supernaturally. Okay, see what you got. Yeah. All I got to do is hit something. Yeah. <laughs> you got to get it in. Okay? No pressure. Yeah. So. No pressure. It's just no pressure. No pressure. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> he makes us all look small. <laughs> there you go. Oh, oh huh? congratulations. Hey, hey, Steve, you still win the 100 grand because you're 100 grand of a father. So great job. Great job. So let's have a seat. Well, that was weak sauce. Yeah. But um, Ed had, uh, Pastor Ed has written a couple of books, and, and two of them we have today. In fact, today you can get two of these books for $20. And if you buy a third, which we're we're asking you to do so because you give that third one away to be a blessing to another father. I, I tell you, when I'm, I'm reading this one, the difference a father makes, and it is life-changing. For any father, there's practical things as well as gems. You know when you read that sentence and it's like, oh, that just changes you. And it changes you for the better. Uh, I grew up without a father, so to read a book like this, it really penetrates the hurt that we all experience sometimes from uh, our dads. And sometimes Father's Day is not the best day, but we're going to find out today why Father's Day or what God can do on Father's Day and turn that around. So, Pastor Ed, you've been with us this past weekend. Uh, you have some resources available, and you just got some text messages from your children at your church yeah. uh, in Anaheim, California. And just to get their support. Now, he's speaking here on Father's Day. And I asked him, I said, is your church okay with this? So just tell us a little bit about what you do and why you do what you do for fathers. Well, you know, um, and you'll hear my story today. You know, my dad was killed in action, so I never knew my dad for a moment. Died just before I was born. And when you carry that wound inside of you, or if your dad's not present, it, 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 it causes your family to, to ache because you as a dad are constantly trying to figure out who you are because the guy who had your name inside of him, your dad, wasn't there. And so I wrote these two books. And, and the reason I'm out on Father's Day, and I'm out on every Father's Day, the Lord speaks to us about where we're to go. Matter of fact, all my kids today are... Wearing Hawaiian shirts. Yeah, I saw that. Jill, your wife, was showing us that. <laughs> That's my uh, beloved Jill of 32 years. Thank you for being and, here, Jill. Um, thank you for being here, too. Thank you. And um, th these books are a 20-year journey into the heart of the father. The father that wants to be your dad, wants to bring you into a place where you no longer have to look back into your history to find out who you are, but you can discover what Jesus knew. You know, Jesus was the most astounding man who ever lived because he wasn't pushy. Hmm. He, matter of fact, in describing him, Isaiah said that he could walk by a bruised life, a bruised reed, that's ready to fall over by the slightest wind, and he could walk by that reed and it wouldn't bend over. Because Jesus was so clear about who he was and had such an amazing relationship with his father. His life had an impact that has changed the world. And that's what these books are about. How to use a dad or mom or boy or girl connect to the father you've always wanted. And then have the family. You know, one of the things that God keeps speaking to me, and I, and I look into you as Hawaiian people, is that you love family. How many would say amen to that? You mm -hmm. love family. Amen. Yeah. And yet there is a huge ache on your island. Because so many dads and moms are stuck in roles that were given to them by their fathers and mothers mm. instead of who God has really called you to be. I don't know about you. I want my family to work. Amen? Amen. You know what I love about these books? It's thin. I can read this in 45 minutes to an hour, and it's, it's really a good read, but it's filled with a lot of gems. So you can pick that up at our bookstore and... Uh, be a blessing to someone. Give it as a Father's Day gift, and it'll bless someone's life. Could you welcome with me Pastor Ed as he comes and shares this morning with us? Have fun. Thank you. 
So what does a dad want on Father's Day? Does he want another Home Depot card? <laughs> or does he want a, a, a question to the ache that men carry? I've been all over the world, beloved. I've been with every kind of guy and coached every kind of family. And I got to tell you, there's an ache in men all over the world. There's an ache in children as well. Matter of fact, Lamentations 5 verse 3 in the message Kind of, it's kind of the Hawaiian song I hear in the air. Listen to the words. Orphans we are, not a father in sight, and our mother are no better than widows. We live in a culture today where 25, 30 years ago, parents had a lot of children. Now today, children have a lot of fathers. And families are, are hurting. Marriages are failing even in the church of Jesus Christ. But see, God has a plan to fix all those things. God has a plan on this Father's Day. Because see, this is a Father's Day, maybe a little bit different than you've ever experienced, is that God loves Father's Day. Because he wants to write something in you that, that, that you didn't get as a child. He wants to heal something inside of you. He wants to... Speak life into something inside of you that maybe your daddy didn't know how to do. I, I've met a lot of dads. I've met a lot of broken dads who have their families back now. And I've never met a dad who didn't love his children. Never met one, even some of the most brutal, wicked guys in the, in the state penitentiaries. They all loved their children, but they didn't know how to speak life or bless them. And they all have the same question every Father's Day. Every dad does. Was I a good father? Was I a good father? And yet so many of us dads, including me and much of my story, I was completely stuck and broken. And I came across this scripture I want to start with today. If you have your Bible, and it's John 14, verses 1 through 4. Jesus speaking to the crowd of his disciples following him, about 500 people at the time. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, but believe also in me. And then he introduces something that has never before been talked about in the history of the world. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. But if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. See, there's a moment that we're all going to experience in our life. And we're going to arrive after we've finished with this body and we pass into a new life in Christ. We're going to arrive in this black lim limousine with the windows all blacked out. And we're going to pull in front of this house that we can't see because there's a big bus in front of this house. And out there, there's going to be a guy. See, I believe in extreme family makeover. So does God. And there's going to be a guy that looks like Ty Pennington. That's going to be Jesus Christ. And he's going to pull you out of the limousine. You've been hidden away, not knowing what's behind that bus. And he's going to look at you, and he's going to look at me, and what is he going to say? Move that bus. And that bus is going to pass away, and we are going to see the Father's house that God has been building for thousands and thousands and thousands of years to restore us and to the one whom he lived his life and said, I can only do what I see my father doing. I can only speak what I hear my father speaking. Jesus was the most credible man who ever worked, the most credible one, because he had the love of the father all through him. And see, identity is a big chief battleground with us as men and women in our life. The world says to you, you are what you do. Experience, if you have passion, then that's who you are. Why don't you try it? We call some of that passion temptation. God says the opposite. Your identity, you know, it doesn't come from what you do. Your identity comes from who I say you are. Your identity comes from your being, who I've made you to be. And so the result in our life, we, we have a world right now that's trying to figure out who they are by what they do. 
And God, and see, the problem with that is that when you get your identity from what you do, what of what you do is broken? And then now your name changes from maybe the given surname that you were born with to your new name, alcoholic. Broken, deserted, abandoned, not wanted. See, the devil loves to name you by your brokenness. He loves you to live in self-hatred. He loves you to stay stuck. Never knowing what it's absolutely like to be loved. To be completely loved. To really be completely loved the way Christ was. And when we don't know who we are, and we don't have a dad in our story who knows how to bless us. Because the reason why dads don't bless us is not that they don't love us, is because they didn't get a blessing from their father. Or their blessing was go out and work. And so what they do, they go out and work, and work, and work, and work. And guess who loses in that equation that children do? Because daddy's never home. I was with a man yesterday at our event. He said, I spent my entire life as a father trying to earn a living because I didn't want to be poor, and I've lost my son. I haven't talked to him in five years. What do I do? You can make all the money in the world. You can have all the things in life. But if you lose your children, you ache. I meet guys like this all over the world. They go, Ed, what do I do? I want my kids back. I'm here to tell you, it is never too late to be an amazing father. It is never too late to be an amazing mom in the life of your kids. Your children out there, they need something that God put inside of you. God put inside of every one of you, if you fathered a child, whether you married that mama or not, you've got a prophetic message inside of you for that child, a name, a blessing, and whatever you say over them, if your presence becomes kind of the ceiling of their life all through the scripture, whatever the father said over the son or daughter became this kind of invisible ceiling in their story. Esau wanted a blessing, and him and Jacob wrestled for it, and Jacob tricked him out of his blessing. And he got the blessing of the father, Jacob did, and Esau didn't. And he struggled his whole life. Somehow, in the the mystery of God, he's put something in us as dads to speak life into our children. I want to read you something that I just got from one of my five. I have five uh, amazing children. And I'm, I'm standing here today not because I got everything right. I'm standing here today because I met the Father. That's our hope. This is from um, Mary, my favorite youngest daughter. I have my favorite oldest son, Edward. I have my favorite middle son, Lucas James. My favorite oldest daughter, Jessica Jean. My favorite middle daughter, Mary Lee, and my favorite youngest son, Joshua David Candy McLaughlin. And so they all wrote me Father's Day cards because every Father's Day I am here and they sow me for your sake. Because this is, listen to Mary's heart. Happy Father's Day to the best dad ever. Thank you for discovering the love of the Father for yourself and modeling that to this love to us that we might know him better. Thank you for helping me to discover who I am by loving me through every season. You and Mom created such a loving home for us. Let's just say us kids are crazy lucky for winning the lottery in the parents category. I love you, Daddy. I am your girl. You see, beloved, when we're not clear about who we are, we'll spend our whole life trying to name ourselves. That started with Adam and Eve in the garden. The very first wound of the father came with Adam and Eve. When they sinned against God, man and woman got stuck in two roles that they've been trying to get out ever since. The role for the guy, the curse that came upon the man, is you'll earn your living by the sweat of your brow. I meet guys all over the world. When 
I ask them who they are. They tell me what they do. I remember when I first started doing this, I asked the guy who he was, and I was in an airport in Denver. He said, I'm Joe. I'm a plumber. I said, you're a what? I'm a, I'm a plumber. You mean to tell me when God made you in the womb and you were getting ready to be born and the water broke from your mama, a voice came from heaven and said, you shall be a plumber unto me. <laughs> or is that what you do? He goes, well, I guess it's, it's what I do. I said, well, then who are you? He goes, I, I, I guess I don't know. And to the girl, the, the, the curse was very insidious. And that although she wanted to rule over her man, that she would, she would be in a relationship where she would be looking to men to find her identity. And when a girl is stuck in her life and she doesn't have a dad who loves her and blesses her and dates her and speaks life into her life, she'll, she'll spend her life as a teenager trying to find a boy she might be able to turn into the man she never got to live with as a little girl. Couples get married today because they're looking for a name in the spouse. And if you're trying to look for your name in the one that you love that you're married to, you know right away that's not going to be complete. As much as I love my wife, and she's an extraordinary woman of 32 years in our life, our love together. I can't look to her for my name. Nor can she look to me because there's something so deep and so powerful in all of us that God has made us for, and he's made us for himself. He's made us to be a new kind of person. Jesus made a promise in John 14, 18, I I won't leave you as orphans. He called everybody in the crowd orphans. It wasn't whether they had a mom or dad, it's that do they know the father is their father. And I want you to turn, if you have uh, your Bible with you, Galatians 4, 4 through 7, I want to walk you through a couple of verses this morning that have been very powerful in my story. So you got to understand something. My story didn't start with a great dad who, who was just in my life and sewed into my life. My life was much like many football players that I knew in the National Football League, overachievers, who used the, their, their sport, whether it be baseball or basketball or football, to work out a pain inside of them because they felt like nobody as a kid. That's why on the sideline, when the camera comes in, what do football players say? Hi, mom. I can't, I can't count on one hand how many players I played with in the National Football League who had a loving, present father. I can tell you thousands of them that I've seen through the years, who have, many who have ended badly because they thought that professional football would be the place where they would finally arrive and get a name that people would respect them. And yet we see the news reports over and over and over and over. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter how much you attain in your life. If you live your life out of a wound that you carry because your dad didn't have a blessing in him to give you, then you ache as a boy. And when you ache as a boy, you get married and you ache as a dad. And without meaning to, you pass that ache right into your kids. But guess what, beloved? There's a better way. (laughs) How many know that God is a God who loves changing names? God is a God who loves changing stories. Well, it says here in Galatians, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, Jesus, born of a woman, Mary, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. I gotta tell you, when I, when I read that, I, it, just, it just shook me. I was 40 years old when I started discovering this with God. You gotta understand, at 40 years old, I had played in the NFL, I had preached with Billy Graham, I set the world record in the bench press, 605 pounds, the National Football League. I did all this stuff to prove myself that I was a man. And no matter what I did, it was never enough. Because you can't make yourself into a man. You can't prove yourself into a man. You can only receive that from God. I didn't know that manhood was something that God wanted me to receive, that that was supposed to come and modeled first from my dad. But in, in 1956... 
On May the 29th, my father was reading his Bible in the book of Matthew. He was a test pilot for the Navy. He saw something in his Bible. He circled a single word, closed his Bible, had a strange look on his face. My mother looked at him and said, am I going to lose you? Can you imagine just that question? My, my, my dad, was, I was still in my mother's stomach, you know. I guess I was about 38 weeks and 45 pounds. I don't know. I was in there <laughs> at that time. <laughs> and she's, no, why would you say that, Gene? He says, well, you have a strange look on your face. Well, the next morning he got up early and he did something really strange. He, he took off these dog tags right here. These military dog tags. And he placed them on the bedside table and kissed my mother goodbye. The next morning, went out to the flight deck, and during his test flight, at about 1.15 in the afternoon, his, his tail fin overheated, his engine started conking out, the oxygen system started to fail, and my dad was in a crash dive towards the beaches of, of Monterey, California, on Memorial Day weekend. His last words on earth were, this is November Papa, taking it in. And he chose to not bail out and took his life for the sake of the people on the beach. And I lost my father 59 Memorial Days ago. Never once got to smell his aftershave, never once got to hang out with him. Well, my mother didn't want me not to have a dad in my life, so she went back to the Naval Academy and shopped for another man. She tried to find a safe one. Chose Dan McGlasson, hence my name, Ed Tandy McGlasson. Ed Tandy was my birth father. McGlasson was my stepfather. Well, he had a very interesting story, and when he was about 13 years old, his father discovered that he was afraid he would drown in the water. So his father took him to a bridge because he couldn't tolerate a son who was afraid of anything and threw him off the bridge into a river. Yelled over him, sink or swim, die or try, it's up to you if you make it. And my father made it to the side. Guess what military service he chose? Submarine service. <laughs> How many of you are living out your legacy trying to answer the question your dad had about who you were? I mean, men who do that their whole life. They'll build companies, they'll build dreams, they'll do everything to try to name themselves, only to lose the family they love. But it's never too late. So my growing up, I was stuck. I was stuck trying to figure out, you know, who I was. And so my stepfather loved football, and because he loved it, I was there too. And I worked and worked and worked to try to please him in every way. But he wasn't one of these guys who knew how to ever say that you arrived. I remember my senior year in high school, we won 42 to 6 on our Father Sunday. 42 to 6. That would be, imagine the University of Hawaii a winning again at some point, 42 to 6. <laughs> and my stepfather comes over across the field, and I'm, I am the captain of the football team, I'm the player of the game, and he looks at me and he says, you know, son, if you would have got that one last block, you would have scored seven more points, one more touchdown. You missed it by that much. And beloved, that was my name. No matter what I did, my entire life from that moment, that was a defining moment. I missed it by that much. So I didn't rest. I didn't take vacations. I didn't come to Hawaii to lay out and smell the coconut breezes. I was working out. My honeymoon, when we first came here on my honeymoon, Jill got me to come, because Jill's middle name is Play. Let's go play and have fun. God gave me a woman who knows how to play. On my honeymoon, I worked out twice a day, drove three hours both ways twice a day to go to a gym. Is that stupid or what? You know what I'm saying? Okay. And so, I mean, I, everything was about work and pushing myself. And so then I get married, and I start having kids and, and, and all this. And guess what I did to my children? I drove them. I repeated the same pattern. I didn't want to, but, but that was in me because my name was, I missed it by that much. And I wounded my children. 
Matter of fact, my kids were, were growing up in the church now, and they were stuck, and they were broken because they were more afraid of me. They, I mean, that little that, that text message is a miracle to me because I have my, the hearts of my children. And when a dad has the hearts of their kids, I mean, there is nothing sweeter for a father than to know that his life matters. And then he can speak life into his kids and they respond. And then he can speak life and love that woman that God has given him. And so I was stuck. I was broken. Jill was feeding me books on on being a father and being a better dad. But I, beloved, I was broken. And here I was leading a church and yet my kids were pastor's kids. They weren't my kids. And I cried out to God in the scripture And I read this verse, the fullness of time had come. God, you know, sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law, that that we might receive adoption. And I, you know, I, I, adoption. God wants to adopt me? It's interesting. In my story, my, my stepfather never adopted me. Because I would have lost the the military benefits for school from my dad who died in action. And so he never adopted me legally. And so I was never, ever somebody's son legally. I didn't know how much that affected me, pushing my heart. But see, when Paul uses that word adoption in Scripture, he uses it, he comes from understanding Rome. And Rome at that time was the, was the most cruel culture to babies there has ever been. I mean, just think about it. When God chose to come to the earth, he didn't come on a white steed as a warrior. He came as an infant. And in Rome, it was actually part of their law. You had till eight years old to determine if you wanted your natural children or not. Not only was abortion just rampant in that culture, but you had till eight years old. You could get rid of your natural children. If they didn't turn out right, you could say, well, imagine using that to get them to clean their room. (laughs) Hey, I can get rid of you. I can get rid of you. Let's see when Paul wrote that. But when you chose to adopt somebody, in Roman law, it was irrevocable. Here, right here in Scripture, God's saying, when the fullness of kind would come, that we might receive adoption as sons. So what is God's plan? Let me say something to you that, that, that changed my life. Every one of you here in this room have been designed by God to have two fathers. You've got your natural father, good or bad. He also wants to become your supernatural father. The first father you're born into, into the limitations of his story, but also in Christ as you're born again, you get your new father. He wants to adopt you today as a son or daughter. See, that's the secret of being the man you need to be or the woman you need to be. It's that you get to be somebody's son or daughter. You get to let go of, what would it mean for you this morning to let go of the brokenness of your family's story where you don't got to look back at why didn't your dad bless you? Why did he abandon you? Why, why did your mom get pregnant at 13 years old and, and that guy wasn't there? And Why do you have another brother or sister from another guy and, and both of those fathers are gone? Why is it awkward at at family events? Because you really don't know who your dad is. And so you've sort of adopted a few, and you've got an uncle as a dad who's been in your life, and and your grandfather is there, but you carry that ache. What would it mean to you today to be able to let go of that ache and, and to be somebody's daughter completely? To be somebody's son? That's what I didn't experience in my life. That we might receive, and because you are sons, the scripture goes on and says, he sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. There's this transferred blessing where now the spirit of Christ that comes into us at the moment that we're born again, there's this adoption happens, and all of a sudden now our heart begins going, hey, hey, Papa, you are my father. 
to where you don't need your dad to get it together. If he does, praise the Lord. But if you're waiting for him to somehow take responsibility for all of the hurt that he caused, he'll probably never do it because he's still stuck because his daddy didn't know how to speak life into him. That's the way the devil has gotten generation after generation after generation. We're still looking back in our story, in our genealogy, in our history, trying to find out who we are. And yet Jesus came and talked about what it would be like to have a brand new life where you can be born again with a brand new father and a blessing to live the life as a man or woman. That's who he's made you to be. That's who he's made me to be. And I was just crying out to God because I was so broken as a dad. I remember one of those moments. Just How many of you made a promise as a father that you would never do to your kids what your dad did to you? Anybody ever do that? And how many of you broke that promise? I remember this time that Edward is not submitting to me. Can you imagine a pastor's kid not submitting to the father who is the lead pastor of a church. And without even meaning to, I went into the room and I just, I drilled him. I said some of the most harsh things to him I've ever said to anybody. And I could just almost hear my stepfather in a drunken stupor saying those things to me as a kid. And yet I couldn't stop saying them to my son and I crushed him and he was in his room and he was just sobbing. He's 11 years old, and I, I crushed the son that I loved with everything that was in me. That's what happens with dads and sons when they get competitive. When a father doesn't know who he is, he competes with his son. And when the son doesn't know who he is, he resists his father and fights against him. But when you have clear identity and blessing from the father, you as a dad can take it all. Because your kids need you to. They need you to be the person that doesn't move. They need you to be the person who hears from God for them. In a world right now that's trying to redesign itself every moment. See, God made you as a dad to be like, like a rock that's just in place that you can count on. And that's what I wanted to be in my own story, but I wasn't. And so I went into my study and I just cried out to God and I was just so disgusted with what I said to my son. And I said, God, why did I do that? And the father that I've always wanted just meets me in that moment. And he says, Ed, the reason you talk to your son that way is that's the way you've talked to yourself. You see, you've learned how to hear my voice through the broken filter of your stepfather when he is drunk and angry, but that's not who I am. If you'll learn how to hear the voice of the Father like Jesus did, I'll make you the kind of man that makes a difference. And man, I was undone. God just showed me my life. You ever had that moment when God just, just in his love, he shows you your life? And I'm going to tell you, my church was about Ed. My kids were about Ed. My marriage was not about Jill and loving her. It was about me. That's why your, your man struggles with you women. And not because they don't love you. It's because they don't know who they are. And so when they, they come up to the giftedness of all the beautiful emotional life that you have, they're intimidated by it because they don't understand it. And because they don't understand it, they've learned from other men in the culture just to get busy doing other things so they go fishing. Or, because we go to where we're confident, imagine what it would be like if you left here as a man today and you loved your woman the way she has asked you to love her your whole marriage. What if you gave in? What, what if you, wife, gave in to your man? And you didn't live out of the wound of your dad in your own story. And you began to meet him as your man and treat him like a man. And you didn't withhold from him because he wasn't behaving right. 
but you poured out yourself and your body on him as much as he needs. What would happen with you and him? Marriage in this house, in the house of God, should be the most passionate, the most powerful, and the world should say, I want some of that. And they don't turn to Hollywood. There's no passion like the passion of a godly couple in the presence of the Holy Spirit in the holy bedroom that God gives you. There's nothing like it out there in the world. Oh, that's right, we do. We talk about sex at church. It should be the only place we do talk about it. Okay, amen? Amen. Oh, boy, you got quiet on me. What's going on here? <laughs> Coconut breezes, passion, orchids. I know why you're quiet. The same thing I was as the Lord is hitting me in this wound I carried. And I said, God, how does that change in my story? And I came to a story that I just want to close with is the baptism of Jesus. I just want to finish one point in the scripture. So if you're no longer, if you're a son then, verse 7 says, then you are no longer a slave but a son and of a son and heir powerful picture I want to just encourage you to do something after today I want you to stop reading this Bible as a Christian and I want you to read this Bible from this moment on as a son or daughter it's like this suppose for a moment that I was an attorney representing a family estate And right up the hill, there was an old man who lost his only son, and he gave me $500 million right here on my iPad to distribute to all of your accounts this morning. So we're going to split it up, and everybody here today is going to get $2.2 million. Anybody raise your hand for that? Okay? But here's the problem. For me to give you this inheritance... There is a stipulation in the document that you have to be a natural child. You can't be an offshoot. You can't just say, I want it. You have to let that father adopt you into his family so that he can give you the inheritance he meant for his son who died in a horrific accident when a mob crowd crucified him on a cross. And at the moment you receive, you allow him to adopt you. All the family inheritance is yours. See, if you're no longer a slave, then you are a son. And if you then are a son or daughter, then you are an heir. And so I was 40 years old. I was broken as a dad. I could tell you a lot of broken dad stories. I write about them and what God spoke to me. And so I cried out to him and came across that story in the book of Matthew. When Jesus is being baptized by John, simple little moment, everybody sort of reads this as uh, the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And he comes out of the water in in, in verse 17, and this voice from heaven audibly speaks. The audible voice of the Father speaks. And this is what he says. This is my beloved Son in whom I love. The Holy Spirit rests on him in the form of a dove right there in front of John the Baptist. You have the Father, you have the Son, and the Holy Spirit in a moment of history. The only other time the audible voice of the Father speaks in the New Testament, he speaks The same word over Jesus. You are my beloved son in whom I love. And I asked the question at 40 years old, being a dad and a Bible teacher, why the audible voice? And I came to find out something astounding. And and even in Jewish history, in Bar Mitzvah and Bat Mitzvah, that just before a boy becomes a man, in a rites of passage where boys become men, because in our culture today, when does a boy become a man? When does a girl become a woman? 
When does she graduate from junior high school? When does he graduate from junior high school and become a man and walk like a man and act like a man and, and receive all the grace you need to be a man? It's very fuzzy. It changes all the time. The devil wants you to think it's by what you do for a living. Or to a girl who you marry, that's who you are. Your identity is your husband. Instead of the woman God's made you to be. His beloved daughter. What I came to find out, I have a Jewish rabbi friend, is the last line of Bar Mitzvah for thousands of years is when fathers end the time and they look at their daughters and sons across the room and they call them out and they use this phrase, this is my beloved son in whom I love. This is a passage, God. This is a moment you did for Christ, but my dad's dead. How, how am I ever going to be connected to that in my own story? I have no dad to call me out. And, and I mean, I, I struggled, and this rabbi friend of mine took me to breakfast, and he's a rabbi who loves Jesus, and, and he, he was talking to me about bar mitzvah and the rites of passage and what I can do as a father for my kids. And he looks at me and says, remember the day that Jesus lost his mom and dad for three days? In the book of Luke, remember the story, beloved? Jesus wanders off at 12 years old, right? Three days later, they discover he's lost. How many of you have ever lost your kids? Anybody ever lost your kids? Hawaiian mama, that's a whole new level, right? That's serious. Imagine you're a Jewish woman who was a virgin. You have now lost the savior of the world. That's like a whole new level. She finds him in Jerusalem asking and answering questions and, when, and really confronting Jesus. Why, why did you run away? He said, Mom, why are you looking for me? Duh. <laughs> Didn't you know I have to be about my father's business? And this rabbi looks at me and says, when a Jewish boy doesn't have his natural father to call him out into manhood, he goes to the temple at 12 years old to ask and answer questions. Jesus was 12. And it hit me. Jesus went there at 12 for me. He went there at 12 for you. Because the father that he wanted to introduce us to us was his father. So that as we're born again in him, he gives us a new beginning. And a few weeks later, I'm in front of a group of high school kids. And I have to teach the last minute. My, my high school leader got sick, and I ended up turning to the passage my father read the night before he died. Not putting two and two together, and in Matthew 14, it's a story of Peter watching something walking on the water, and they think it's a ghost, and when he gets close to the boat, Peter says, if it's really you, Lord, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said what? Come. That was the word my dad circled in his Bible. 40 years later, I am reading that in his Bible in front of these high school kids. And right in that moment, having, having an incredible encounter with Jesus in, in college, the father I always wanted visited me in that moment. And this is what he said. The last word your father heard before he died was the word come. At 400 miles an hour, my daddy got courage to give his life for the sake of those on the beach because of the word of God in him. And then he said, and that's what I called your life for, to call people to come to me. And then he said, from this moment on, you are no longer a pastor, no longer a football player. In other words, you don't get your name from what you do, but you are my beloved son in whom I love. And this unconditional love and revelation of the father I never knew I could have hit me in a moment in front of these kids, and it righted something in me. For the first time in my life, I had Pono. My life. It mattered. I was somebody's son. And I'm like, God, what do I do for my kids? And I started calling out my, my sons. I started calling out my daughters. 
And I watched the Spirit of God descend on them in the same way it descended on me as the blessing of the Father in heaven was transferred and manhood was bestowed upon my sons when they were 13 years old and, and they were growing. And, and my daughters as well. I remember Mary, she wanted to want to wrote me the text today. She was wanting to be a woman so bad. She was 14 years old. She sending me messages every week. Dad, I'm going to be 14 on my birthday. I'm so much more mature than my, when my sister became a woman. I, I want you to call me out on my 14th birthday. She read my book. She had this incredible stature in her. And so I took her out. I said, okay, baby, and bought her a ring and took her to a, a restaurant that I, could, I can't take Jill to or to Jessica to. Because in my family, I've been dating my daughters, and if I take them to the same restaurant, it's a big fight. It's not good. It's ugly. <laughs> really ugly. I love it. I've been dating three of the most beautiful women in all of California. My two daughters and my wife. And my stepfather never once kissed my mother in front of me. You want to transcend your father? You get a new dad. You want to transcend your mother? You get a new father in your life. And I, call, I took her to a note to walk her in, and we walked in arm in arm, and she was just drop-dead gorgeous, hair extensions, long flowing robes, high heels. I'm walking in with an old guy with like a young chick. And you know, I got weird looks. <laughs> but it is California. Some guys are going, right on, dude. You got it going on. No, 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 no. Daughter, I'll give you one of these. <laughs> that time when the dinner came and I got down on one knee because I prayed to the Lord, how do I call my daughter out? I got down on one knee and I pulled out a ring. And I said, sweetheart, are you ready to put this ring on? It's going to be a token between you and the Lord of holding back your, your body into your wedding night. And it's also a token that from this moment on, when I pray over you, you're no longer going to be a girl. You're going to be a woman of God. And I slipped that ring on her finger, and I looked at her and told her all the things I loved about her, and she bawled, and I called her the beloved of the Lord. And she just jumped in my arms. This waitress is watching this whole thing go on and sees it and comes out and sees my daughter with all of her makeup off her face and, <laughs> and, and says, are you okay? And my daughter goes... Yes, I just became a woman. <laughs> Which can mean a lot of things in our culture, right? And, and she said, no, my daddy brought me here because inside of every father, it's a prophetic voice. And he brought me here to bless me so that I could walk as a woman of God and know the father is my father. I realized in reading that scripture in Galatians that my job as a dad isn't going to be just a great dad. My dad is to father them as their first father so they get their second father. So they get adopted. And guess what? Then your grandchildren get their second father. And your great-grandfather. And your great-great-grandfather. So the reason we're here this morning is to give you an opportunity on this Father's Day to be fathered by God. Maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus totally. Well, let me tell you, the Bible says that he who has a son has life and he who doesn't, doesn't have life. Maybe you're here today as a daughter and your dad has never blessed you. We're going to have a family blessing today for sons and daughters where you don't have to listen, girls, when you get this for yourself, you never have to look at another man to name you again. You never have to see, have a man name you. You can be who God has made you to be because he's your father. And you're his daughter. Sons, you don't ever have to look at your toys to name you or the amount of fish you catch or the business you build or your failure of what you have not done anymore. When God becomes your father, he changes your family history and he makes it all new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, for all those who are in Christ become a brand new creation. Behold, everything passes away. How does that happen? We've got to receive this adoption. Could you all stand with me right now? And the first step here on Father's Day, maybe you've been invited. Maybe you're not a regular part of a church. Maybe you've not seen churches being part of your life. Well, let me tell you, I, there's not a single atheist that I've ever met that had a loving dad. 
Nietzsche struggled with it. All of them struggle with it. If God's like my dad, then he must not be there. But I got to tell you, he is drawing you here today. Because 2 Corinthians 6.18 says, God says, I want to be your father. And that you be my sons and daughters. How long are you going to wait for a healing from your family when you can have it right now? That's why I'm here. But first, it's for those who've, who need Christ in their life. You've never been born again. You've never just surrendered your life to Christ. You've been listening to pastor. Maybe you've been just sitting in the back and, and hanging back, but you've never been totally in. And you said, Ed, I'm one of those people, and I want to receive Jesus just the way you did, just the way Pastor Sheldon did. And he did. He got saved on Father's Day. This could be your Father's Day where you get the Father you've always wanted. So if you close your eyes for a moment, I'm going to ask if that's one of you that's here today that says, I need God as my Father, and I want to be born again first. Would you just lift your hand right now and say, would you pray for me? Just hold it up. God bless you. I see your hands. God bless you. God bless you all through this room. Yes, Lord. And I want you to pray a prayer out loud with me right now. And I'd like the whole family to pray it together out loud. Just say, Jesus, right now, I surrender. I give my life to you. I ask you to forgive me for all of the sin in my life, for all of my running away. And I receive you as my Savior right now. Jesus, make me into the man or woman I need to be. I give you my life. In Jesus' name, amen.